Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. The name conjures up brutal images of torture and slow death. Most sent there never returned, falling victim to tropical disease, failed escape attempts, and murder. Occupied at one time by Alfred Dreyfus and Papillon, it was the most terrifying prison in the world. As we go in search of history to find Devil's Island, Hell on Earth. Nearly once a month on a malaria-infested stretch of South American coastline, the French government launches communication satellites into orbit. This country's glistening space center is located in the colonial territory of French Guiana, an unforgiving, nearly uninhabitable expanse of sweltering jungle. Situated just 300 miles north of the equator, it is an ideal place from which to launch spacecraft, despite the stifling heat and humidity. But not far from where Ariane 5 rockets thunder into the sky, a different kind of noise was once heard, the agonizing sounds of suffering and death. Not so long ago, the tiny territory of French Guiana housed the worst prison colony in the world. It was known as the Dry Guillotine, the Green Hell, Devil's Island. From 1852 until 1945, France shipped its most incorrigible prisoners to the jungle camps of French Guiana. It was not the bullets of guards, but it was the mosquitoes that killed the prisoners. It was not the bullets of guards, but it was the ulcers that turned into infections and gangrene that killed the prisoners. It was not the guards' bullets, but it was the vampire bat bites which got infected that killed the prisoners. It was a matter of paying with your body or being subjected to beatings. If you let them use your body, you were treated well. If you didn't, they paid another convict to kill you. Once the head was severed from the body, it was grabbed by the ears and shown to the other prisoners. And the executioner would say, in the name of the people of France, justice has been done. The French saw the territory's remote location and brutal climate as fitting punishment for the dregs of their society. It's wet, it's mildewed, and uh, it's kind of like, I, I always imagine that it's the pictures of, of the weather on Guadalcanal and, and uh, you know, in the Pacific War. That kind of constant drip and wet and humidity and the isolation. Though Devil's Island was only a small speck of land nine miles offshore, the forbidding name stuck to all the dozens of prisons in French Guiana. But the 35,000 square miles of rainforest was not always a place of misfortune. The Indians who first lived in the area gave Guiana its name, which means land of many waters. Its origins told a more promising story, one of a lost city of gold. In 1595, English explorer Sir Walter Raleigh published a book, The Discovery of the Large, Rich, and Beautiful Empire of Guiana. In his book, Raleigh wrote about a mystical city he believed lay deep inside the Guiana rainforest. He called the place El Dorado. The romantic reputation was short-lived. There's where the myth and the legend comes. It was an extremely difficult place to colonize. But at the time, it was considered worth it, worth it to attempt to first cross the Atlantic Ocean, which in those days was quite a feat, and then come into the swamps or come into the jungle and look for gold, 
or start plantations. In 1616, Raleigh asked England's King James to return to Guiana to search for El Dorado. The king agreed, as long as Raleigh promised not to fight with Spanish settlers in the area. But the expedition was a disaster. Long simmering rivalries between the two nations led to battles. Raleigh's son was killed. When Raleigh returned to England, King James had him beheaded for his defiance. Raleigh's search would later inspire Edgar Allan Poe to write a poem about the misadventures. Shadow, said he, where can it be, this land of El Dorado? Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow. Ride, boldly ride, the shadow replied, if you seek for El Dorado. Despite Guiana's difficult climate and terrain, the craze to colonize had Spain, England, and France all attempting to settle Guiana. In 1680, the French sent a man named Ponset, Lord of Brittany, to Guiana to oversee the colonization in the area that is now the city of Cayenne. But the expedition of 200 men was poorly equipped. The heat, humidity, and swarming mosquitoes quickly drove Ponset mad. The slightest infraction by his men led to severe reprimands, including cutting out the tongues of those who spoke against him. It was at his makeshift camp that Ponset built Guiana's first prison for his own men. It didn't last long. Ponset's abusive treatment of the local natives led to disaster. A few of Ponset's men escaped by boats into the sea, but most were killed. It's believed they became steaks cooked by the Indians on an open fire. The sinister reputation of French Guiana became some type of whispered, not completely understood uh, idea of some green hell. What had been previously El Dorado, the golden refuge, the golden possibility, became green hell, where you went into the jungle and you died. Despite the hardships, the lust for land went on. During the 18th century, control of the jungle nation changed several times among the English, Dutch, and French. In 1763, it was France's King Louis XV who wanted to expand his declining empire. He sent 14,000 people to colonize Guiana. It didn't take long before the bodies started piling up, not from battle, but from disease. Within weeks, yellow fever and typhoid began to take its toll. And within six months, the mortality rate had been uh, such that the survivors had really not even the energy to bury the remaining corpses. In two years, disease killed 10,000. Those still alive took refuge on three small islands nine miles off the coast. Fewer mosquitoes and cooler temperatures led the survivors to call the specks of land the Salvation Islands. Those still alive stayed away from the smallest of the islands. It was nearly barren. The currents were deadly and killer sharks patrolled nearby. The superstitious colonists believed demons lived there. They named the place Devil's Island. When the colonists were rescued and returned to France, they said Guiana was cursed. Of the 14,000 who came out, only several hundred eventually survived and went back to France. And they told their story, and the story was one of disease, of death, and desperation. And from there, in France, the sinister reputation of French Guiana got started. For the next century, the world stayed away from the foreboding jungles of Guiana. Only lepers set foot on Devil's Island. But in 1852, 
Napoleon III was desperate to find a way to relieve overcrowding in French jails. Guiana seemed to be the answer. The jungles could serve as a natural prison for France's most notorious criminals, who could be used to colonize the country, something no one had yet been able to do. In 1852, Napoleon sent 6,000 French convicts to Guiana. The voyage from France to Guiana was a hell of its own. Men were kept in cages in the holds of prison ships. They froze when the three-week journey began and sweltered as their ship approached the equator. Many quickly became sick. Vomit mixed with excrement spilled from buckets onto the decks during high seas. The vile conditions often led to violence. Most of the prisoners were able to procure knives to settle personal feuds. The personal feuds very, very often stemmed from gambling, money, homosexual favors. And in the prison ship where the prisoners were kept 80 to a hold, the only way that the guards could control them if they began what appeared to be an insurrection was the use of steam hoses in the holds. And that usually quieted the prisoners down very, very, very quickly. The harrowing trip ended in the prison city of Saint Laurent de Moroni. Saint Laurent ended up being one of the most bizarre small towns in South America. It was completely cut off from the rest of French Guiana and the rest of South America since no roads had ever been uh, built to link Saint Laurent with any other parts of the colony. With the town's inhabitants watching, guards took the men from the ships and marched them to the massive prison. As they were processed, they were given some startling news. The French had instituted a new law for the prisoners without telling them. Once their term was finished, men would have to live in Guiana for a period as long as their original sentence. The French believed freed prisoners would marry local women and then settle in Guiana. It was because of the idea of colonization, but uh, in fact it was to to say that the France is a, a good country, we don't want the bad men, we want to send them very far from France. Convicts were given a tour of the tools of punishment, employed for those who disobeyed prison rules or managed to commit crimes while prisoners. This iron bar is called the justice bar. The punished man, lying on the floor, would present his right foot to the guard, who lifted the iron bar to remove the holding part of the ring. The shackle was placed on the punished one's foot, threaded through the axle, and the holding part was reinserted and locked underneath. But the ultimate punishment was in the large courtyard of the prison, the guillotine. The executions, usually used as punishment for killing guards, were brutal events, chilling reminders of the strict discipline demanded by prison officials. Prisoners were forced to kneel in front of the condemned and watch the killings. This is where the heads fell. Of course, before being taken to the guillotine, those who were sentenced to death went through the clerk's office, where they had to sign a form officially discharging them from the colony. After that, they were allowed to smoke a last cigarette or to drink a last glass of wine or rum. The executions were unforgettable for those who saw them. Rosette Scott was a young girl living in Saint Laurent when she sneaked into the prison and watched as three men were executed. Some of them were more afraid than others. The first was asked what he had to say, and he said, I regret what I did. They asked, do you want to see a priest? He said, of course. The priest came and the man confessed. Then they covered him with something, told him to sit, and the guillotine came down and cut his neck. You could see the head fall into a basket. And then they said, judgment 
has been rendered. However, the rendering wasn't always swift. The blade, dulled from heat and humidity, often had to be dropped more than once. And sometimes the blade didn't work at all, according to Saint Laurent resident Flore Lethal. I knew a former convict. You know how you hear people say there's some innocence out there? Well, the blade fell in the man's neck, but it didn't cut through. So they stopped the execution since his head didn't fall. This convict lived until he was 90. He became a curiosity and would always show his scar. New convicts were separated into two groups, transportés, those serving terms of hard labor, and relégués, petty criminals convicted of multiple misdemeanors sent to Guyana indefinitely. Transportés considered themselves to be real prisoners, and they looked down upon the relégués as being lazy, as being undesirables. In the prison colony, there was a hierarchy, and a bank robber would possibly consider himself to be on the top of the heap. In descending order would be child molesters, would be rapists. And then there were the relegates, which were even lower than the child molesters and rapists, because they were just considered to be people who were too lazy and yet had ended up, because of their own stupidity, ended up being sent to French Guiana for the rest of their lives. The prisoners waited for officials to decide where they should be sent. The healthy ones went to the notorious jungle camps of the interior. There, they clear-cut the thick rainforest by hand and built their own cells. And they faced almost certain death from disease, malnutrition, and exhaustion. Life on the prison islands was not much better. Though the temperatures and mosquitoes were not as severe as the interior, the prisons on the islands offered their own special misery. Ile Royale was the largest of the three and held the most dangerous criminals sent to Guiana. St. Joseph was used exclusively as a punishment prison. Only those serving time in solitary confinement were sent there. The smallest of the three was Devil's Island, the most desolate spot in the colony. It was used to house political prisoners who were seen as threats to national security. The most famous was French Army Captain Alfred Dreyfus. In February 1895, an unassuming man was led in shackles to a hut on Devil's Island, the most remote spot in the French Guiana penal colony. Though the jungle prisons on the mainland were filled with murderers, rapists, and thieves, this man had more guards than any of them. His name was Alfred Dreyfus, a French army captain convicted of selling military secrets to Germany. He was sentenced to life on Devil's Island. Actor Richard Dreyfus traces his lineage to the French army captain and has closely studied the Dreyfus affair. Alfred Dreyfus was the only Jewish member of the general staff of the French army. Because he was Jewish, the investigation basically went no farther and it was simply assumed that he was guilty and in a very patriotic frenzy, he was sent to uh, inaugurate the penal colony at Devil's Island because he was this terrible traitor to the French people. In fact, he was completely innocent. When he arrived at the small speck of land in April 1895, he was the island's first and only prisoner. He was housed in a 12 by 12 foot shack, a dozen yards from the pounding waves. He was watched 24 hours a day. Dreyfus being sent to Devil's Island was a special case in the history of the penal colony. There were 70,000 prisoners sent here over a century, but no other prisoner ever was the subject of this type of surveillance and of this type of confinement. Other prisoners were put in solitary confinement, but there was one guard for every 30 prisoners. Here, there were six guards for one prisoner. There was no way that Dreyfus could, for five seconds, be out of the glance of the guards. His every movement was watched and noted down. 
The guards watched Dreyfus from an anteroom attached to his small shack. No one was allowed to speak to him. The guards wouldn't speak back to him. He was alone on this island in this little hut with this terrible climate and um, debilitating weather. Um, and he, he, he often felt that he was going mad. And though the island was just a few hundred yards from the heavily populated Ile Royale, there was little contact made with the outside world. In fact, the currents surrounding Devil's Island were so deadly that the guards rarely risked landing a boat there. Instead, a cable was run from Ile Royale to Devil's Island. Every few days, a basket of food would be sent to Dreyfus and his guards. The isolation drove Dreyfus to the brink of insanity. In letters to his wife, Lucy, he wrote about the torments of Devil's Island. Such torture ends up surpassing the limits of human energy. It has to end. If there were only myself, my disgust with people and things is so deep that I would long for nothing but that great repose, eternal rest. Every time that I break down during my long, solitary days and nights and would like to close my eyes in order to see think and suffer no more, I stiffen in a violent effort of my whole being and shout to myself, you are not alone. You are a father. You must defend your honor and that of your wife and your children. Day after day, week after week, Dreyfus lived his life without contact the few letters he was given from his wife were censored. If I succumb, and these lines never reach you, my dear Lucy, know that I shall have done all that is humanly possible to resist so long and painful a martyrdom. I have had enough. My blood is burning my skin, the fever devouring me. When will this torture end? Five years after being sent to Devil's Island, the conspiracy that put Dreyfus in prison began to unravel. His conviction overturned. He returned in 1899 to France and eventually cleared his name. The notoriety of his case had spread. Those who had never heard of the prison colony in French Guiana now knew the name Devil's Island. And though Dreyfus's case was the best known, his treatment in the penal colony was not unique. The French built a punishment prison on the island of St. Joseph, not far from Devil's Island. Up to 150 men were kept there at any one time, all housed in solitary confinement cells. Most men sent there were being punished for trying to escape from Guiana. Inside the cells, what did they have? Just a plank, iron bars where the guards walked above on a catwalk so they could see everything that went on in the cells. The prisoners never left their cells. They were fed through a hole in their door. Medical attention was virtually non-existent. Almost all the prisoners contracted scurvy, dysentery, pneumonia, but most of the prisoners went further than that and went crazy. For exercise, a prisoner could walk three or four paces across the cell, turn, and walk back. When it rained, the open air cells became cement swamps. During the hottest days of summer, there were ovens. Once a week, the prisoners would be asked to show themselves through the square hole in their cell door. The men would stick out their heads like horses in a stable to be given a shave or be interrogated by the guards. And though the solitary cells were greatly feared, there was a place on St. Joseph that was even worse, the dark hole cells. The prisoners were kept here in total darkness the prisoners were isolated, never saw the light of day, 
The guards occasionally would, up above from the catwalk, take a look through a trap that they had up above here. A few minutes, a few seconds to see if the prisoner was still alive and then closed again. The prisoner was fed through a hole where his latrine bucket and food bucket was brought in. While movies and books by prisoners have portrayed the prison guards as barbarians, most were actually sympathetic. Many had volunteered for duty in the penal colony as a way of gaining promotion. They and their families had to endure the same torrid weather and isolation as the prisoners. Like the prisoners, the guards were biding their time until they could leave French Guiana for more pleasant surroundings. But unlike the prisoners, the guards were usually out of the colony within a year or two. And while the processing and oversight of the prison population was their main order of business, the guards had to contend with a much more serious situation. They knew that every prisoner in the penal colony was willing to do anything to escape, even kill a guard. Though the heat and humidity of French Guiana often drove men insane, there was another more maddening fact of life in the penal colony that drove men mad. Freedom. Some prisoners in French Guiana were allowed to freely roam the streets. Officials knew there was no way for them to escape. Ocean currents were deadly and the rainforest was impenetrable. But that didn't stop the desperate ones from trying. The problem was not escaping from French Guiana. It was to avoid eventual recapture. There were several possibilities that a prisoner could take from the mainland of French Guiana. First possibility would be to walk straight into the jungle, home a certain death, or a certain recapture and punishment back after the prisoner had been caught. Because nobody was able to trek a thousand miles through the jungle and survive. Most attempts to escape took place by boats. Getting a boat was the main objective of any convict looking for a way out. Prisoners would bribe local fishermen to arrange for a boat. Boats were usually left up the Moroni River near Saint Laurent. A prisoner would have to trek through the jungle undetected and find his waiting boat in thick underbrush. Those who went upriver or took the forest, they never made it. Only their skeletons were recovered. That saddens us here in French Guiana, because a lot of the convicts were killed by the animals of the immense virgin forest of French Guiana, our country. But just getting a boat was no guarantee of freedom. Across the river in Dutch Guiana, today's Suriname, the Dutch wanted no part of escaping prisoners and quickly sent them back. Instead, Prisoners would have to sail their boats, that were little more than canoes with rags for sails attached, out to open sea and head south to Brazil or north to a Caribbean island, a journey of hundreds of miles. Most escaping prisoners had little knowledge of navigation, especially for a journey that would last several weeks. The rough seas of French Guiana ended most escape attempts with a watery death. Virtually every prisoner attempted to escape at least once. But most of the escapes ended in, in, in disaster 24 hours or 48 hours later. If the elements didn't end an escape attempt, then the bounty hunters would. Because the prison guards were unwilling to trek far into the jungle and risk being killed by escaping convicts, they hired other prisoners to do the work for them. These hunters were usually freed prisoners who were serving out their term of doublage, the second half of their sentence as free men in Guiana. They would set traps for the escaped convicts who were hungry. They would be lured by some smoking meat, would venture in to eat, and would get caught. Others killed. The guards found that their convict bounty hunters had little sympathy for their comrades in crime. They were hunted everywhere. On the road, there was a place where escaped convicts would arrive. Then one of the men who caught them made them work. And when they were finished with all the construction, 
he made them dig holes. And they were killed and dumped into the holes. These were human beings. Even if they were in the penal colony, they shouldn't have done those things. But some made it. One of the most bizarre stories of escape from French Guiana was that of Charles de Rudio. In 1858, de Rudio had been sentenced to life in Guiana for his role in an attempt to assassinate Napoleon III. But de Rudio was lucky shortly after he arrived in French Guiana. De Rudio and nine other prisoners stole a boat. The men sailed north to British Guiana, and six months later, de Rudio managed to flee to the United States. He joined one of the black regiments fighting for the North during the American Civil War. Following the war, he went west and wound up under the command of General George Custer at Little Bighorn. He was one of a handful of Custer's men to survive. The best known story of escape from French Guiana and Devil's Island is actually not true at all. It's the story of Henri Charrière, a convicted murderer known to the world as Papillon. There's no doubt that Henri Charrière, known as Papillon, was a prisoner in the penal colony of French Guiana. And there's no doubt that Papillon escaped from the penal colonies during the Second World War. But what he tells in his book Papillon is largely fictitious in that many of the events that he attributes to himself were carried out by other prisoners. In his book, published in 1968, Charrière says he tried to escape nine times. Experts believe that a convict who attempted that many escapes would have been well known in the prison camps, but no one heard of Charrière before he wrote his book. Papillon stayed here in cell 47. While waiting to be shipped to Devil's Island after his second failed escape attempt, he carved his initials on the floor. There's no record of Charrière spending years in solitary confinement on St. Joseph, as is claimed in the book. And those who have studied escape attempts question whether anyone, especially a man physically beaten by life in French Guiana, could have paddled nine miles in open sea on a raft made of coconuts. Regardless of the truth, it did make a good story, one that Hollywood quickly picked up on. Papillon, the greatest adventure of escape ever filmed. Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman starred in the 1972 movie Papillon. Charrière enjoyed some of his fame and fortune, but he died at the age of 67, the same year as the film's release. Leaving the hideous penal colony is something which has captured the attention of American filmmakers and more recently French filmmakers. And references to the penal colonies of Guiana go back as early as 1925. The first Phantom of the Opera with Lon Chaney portrays the Phantom as an escapee from Devil's Island. Movies of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s presented brutal portrayals of life in the colony. Stars like Boris Karloff and Humphrey Bogart made classic films like Passage to Marseille that condemned the French for their harsh treatment of prisoners. Escape from Devil's Island made for great storytelling, but it also focused international attention on these inhumane conditions. In the late 1930s, the French government knew it had to do something about its penal colony. Even though courts had become more careful about whom they sentenced to serve hard time in Guiana, world leaders condemned the inhumane conditions in the penal colony portrayed in the media and in the movies. In 1938, France announced it would close the prisons in French Guiana government officials said no more prisoners would be sent, and those still there would finish their sentences or die, whichever came first. The Second World War came, and conditions in French Guiana got worse. There is no other moment in the history of the penal colony which is open to so much controversy and discussion as the Second World War. 
Some feel that the penal colony, always tough and difficult, became a virtual extermination camp during the Second World War. Others claim there was virtually no change for the prisoners. Statistics point, however, to the fact that the mortality rate went up considerably. The Allied blockade of the Atlantic left French Guiana, already a difficult place to get to, virtually cut off from the rest of the world. Supplies were scarce. Ships could not reach port. Food and medicine became non-existent. Crime skyrocketed. Only after the Allies defeated the Germans in Europe did the conditions improve. As the war ended, the French again came under intense international pressure to close the colony. They finally gave in. After 100 years and 70,000 prisoners passing through, the penal colony closed on June 28, 1947. The last 600 men still alive in the prisons of French Guiana and Devil's Island were set free. Most wandered the streets of Cayenne, the colony's capital, wondering what to do. One prisoner wrote, Nobody knew where they would sleep that night, as the guards yelled that it was no longer their problem. By nightfall, we filled every back alley in Saint Laurent, and most of us slept in the public market. Though the prisoners were given the opportunity to return to France, almost all of them stayed. There was nothing for them back home. The convicts began to assimilate into French Guiana society, but old habits from prison died hard. The animosity between the transportés, the hardened criminals, and the relégués, the petty thieves, remained. My father was a regulé, and it affected him. Let's say a First Communion was being celebrated. He was not included. He couldn't attend. He remained outside by the door to have a drink, but didn't get in. In the bars, he would go to get a shot of rum. But if other former condemned convicts from the transportation camp were there, he didn't go in. He had to wait for them to leave. They'd always crack a joke about him. If he went in, he was insulted. The regulés were outcasts. People didn't want to see them because it was shameful to be caught for stealing a can of sardines. A guy who had killed or carried out a big swindle, stolen from a bank or something, was accepted in the community. The prison camps and the main penitentiary were left to rot. It didn't take long for the jungle to reclaim much of the land. For the residents of French Guiana, the end of the penal colony meant an end to a structured way of life and an upheaval to the economy. When the French were here, all the streets were very clean. There were plants and flowers everywhere. I used to go out dancing, and I left my house unlocked. I would come home at five or six in the morning, and all my things were still there. Now, if I go out, they'll take everything, even the laundry hanging outside. In 1975, the French again tried to colonize French Guiana. 3,000 settlers came, desiring to create new cities in the jungles. But like the expeditions centuries earlier, none of those who arrived were prepared for the hardship. The expedition quickly disbanded. It was at this time that France found one thing Guiana was good for, a perfect spot from which to launch rockets. Rockets launched near the equator take less time and fuel to reach orbit than those launched from a more northerly location. The government built a space center in the city of Kourou. Today, Communication satellites are sent into orbit from the same land that once housed France's worst criminals. Most residents of today's French Guiana live as part of a French welfare state. Cayenne is known for its namesake chili pepper, but otherwise the country has few exports. <laughs> 
Only two prisoners from the colony are known to still be alive. Both live in Saint Laurent. One is in a dilapidated state-run hospital and is near death. The other lives in a small shack about four blocks from the prison that was once his home. Bonjour. The prisoner refuses to talk about his time in the penal colony. He says he still fears repercussions from the government. The prison's influence is still felt a half century later. Though much of the Salvation Islands are off limits, visits can be made to some of the places where convicts once suffered. And a hotel has opened on Ile Royale in the barracks where convicts once slept. I believe certain things in the stories that we hear about the prison colonies are untrue. Certain aspects that it was a concentration camp with the only desire of the government to exterminate the prisoners is, in my view, untrue. But the notoriety of the prison colony is deserved. The stories of the lost prison world of Devil's Island remain locked in the green hell of French Guiana. It is a world rocketing into the future while still searching for a resolution to its past. It is a closure that can only be found when we go in search of history. <laughs>